Same person, same commute, different risk. One of the leading causes of serious injuries and fatalities in motorcycle collisions are motorcycle riders. In fact, the number one killer is excessive speed in urban areas. Please, do your part to help lower motorcycle-related accidents in Alberta. Use proper riding gear and obey all traffic rules. Ride smart, ride safe, think bike. A message from the Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society. The Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society reminds you that braking is not an exact science. Different vehicles, different braking times and conditions. Following too close further compounds the problem. Not seeing gravel and potholes adds to the danger. Pay close attention to stop signs and traffic lights. Remember, even a fender bender can kill a motorcyclist. This message from the Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society. Same person, same commute, different risk. One of the leading causes of serious injuries and fatalities in motorcycle collisions are motorcycle riders. In fact, the number one killer is excessive speed in urban areas. Please, do your part to help lower motorcycle-related accidents in Alberta. Use proper riding gear and obey all traffic rules. Ride smart, ride safe, think bike. A message from the Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society. Uh -huh. The Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society reminds you that braking is not an exact science. Different vehicles, different braking times and conditions. Following too close further compounds the problem. Not seeing gravel and potholes adds to the danger. Pay close attention to stop signs and traffic lights. Remember, even a fender bender can kill a motorcyclist. This message from the Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society. Same person, same commute, different risk. One of the leading causes of serious injuries and fatalities in motorcycle collisions are motorcycle riders. In fact, 
The number one killer is excessive speed in urban areas. Please, do your part to help lower motorcycle-related accidents in Alberta. Use proper riding gear and obey all traffic rules. Ride smart, ride safe, think bike. A message from the Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society. The Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society reminds you that braking is not an exact science. Different vehicles, different braking times and conditions. Following too close further compounds the problem. Not seeing gravel and potholes adds to the danger. Pay close attention to stop signs and traffic lights. Remember, even a fender bender can kill a motorcyclist. This message from the Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society. from the studio at Production World. It's the seventh annual Alberta Motorcycle Safety Society Spring Campaign Launch. Please welcome your host, the president of AMSS, Leanne Langlois. Welcome everyone. This is a great time to remind everyone that we the riders are back on the road and ask that everyone, and I mean everyone from two wheels to 18 wheels, share the road so we can get home safely. We have some exciting things to share with you today, including topics from our panel, a message from the Minister of Transportation, all about For the Love of Motorcycles, and how you could have a chance of winning up to $10,000. No joke. We'll get into that later, though. In case you were wondering where that fancy music came from, or thought it sounded a bit familiar, that is our theme song from our Think Bike podcast that kicked off season two on April 20th, produced at the Road 55 studio with our longtime friend, Bryn Griffiths. It is available on most po podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, Prime, Spotify, and so many more. Find it, subscribe or follow, tune in, and listen to all the amazing guests we bring on to talk about important topics regarding motorcycle safety. Speaking of guests on our podcast, all three of our panelists today have participated e either directly or their company has in the past and upcoming podcasts. Today on our show, we have Lanchi Deck, owner of Two Cool Motorcycle School in Calgary. She is live on site from the facility. We have Justin Napick with us from Edmonton Fire and Rescue, as well as owner of On Track Performance. And we have John Bully here from the Edmonton Motorcycle Road Racing Association, which he is the president of. Honorable Rajan Sani, Minister of Transportation at the province of Alberta, was not able to be with us today. We are so grateful to the province for their continued support and the partnership with AMSS for several years now. The minister did want to be a part of the show and sent this message along to us. Hello there, I'm Rajan Sani, Alberta's Minister of Transportation. May is Motorcycle Safety Month. I know that all of you are looking forward to another season riding our highways and visiting all the beautiful places in our province. I want to thank all the members and volunteers of the Alberta Motor Safety Society for the work you do to educate and promote safe motorcycle use in our province. I'm very pleased to announce Alberta's government has approved a grant of $25,000 to support your important work. It is a sad reality that many motorcyclists are injured or killed on our roads and highways every year. In a typical year, about 27 motorcyclists die and more than 535 are injured on Alberta's roads. That number is far too high. That's why we continue to work very hard to educate motorists on their responsibilities, especially when sharing the road with motorcycles. We share your goal of safer roads and reducing injuries and deaths on our highways. Thank you for your dedication to safety. 
Have a safe and enjoyable riding season. Thank you. Thank you to the minister for sending that important message along. We're going to jump into some statistics here from 2021. So last year, we saw only one less fatality than there was in 2020. 18 men, two women lost their lives. We recorded the youngest at about 18 years old and the oldest at about 62. That is kind of what we know. The age groups of concern, as you can see from this graph, are the 30 to 50. Justin, as a first responder, do you find that interesting or not shocking? It doesn't surprise me a lot because it's such a wide berth. Um, most of our ridership tends to fall right within that. So it makes the most sense that those are the people that um, we're finding get, get injured. Um, I would say that uh, most of our um, statistics would, uh, would kind of fall exactly with that. Okay, perfect. And then we have by type of motorcycle in those collisions, we've got the majority of this year were cruisers, where last year it was sport bikes. John, as an avid rider on sport bikes, do you, do you see this as a normal trend for that kind of even split, or what do you think? Yeah, I'd say it's pretty on par with, uh, you know, trends that have been in the past. Um, sadly, it's a little disproportionate too to the total numbers of riders that are on the, on the streets. You know, there's quite a few more people out there with cruisers um, it's, and they're involved in less accidents than uh, the people on sport bikes and it's just kind of a sad uh, statistic to see. And we'll kind of get into some options for people who are maybe riding outside of their means or speed a little bit later with you on that. One thing that we noticed this year, we started tracking what was happening in rural versus urban. And Lanchi, I'm going to come to you. 80% of our fatalities this year are on urban roadways. What would you say is something we need to look at if we're having most of our fatal collisions out in the country? Um, I think it has to... A lot of it is that out in the country, we've got, you know, more animals and, and with the open spaces, a lot of people feel that they can just, you know, go a lot faster. They're not as aware of their surroundings. And um, I think that leaves it open for, for things to happen out there. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's so many factors out in the open road, even more so than the vehicles in the city. We have single versus multi-vehicle collisions. Uh, the interesting thing about last, or in the 2020 season, we had about 70% were single, or were single vehicle and mostly, uh, you know, obviously rider error in that. This year, we see more multi-vehicle collisions. However, the interesting statistic about that is about half of that 68% are deemed rider error anyway. So our own community seems to be, um, a, we have to do better ourselves and be better champions of our own sport and, and make sure that we're adhering to road rules as well. It's easy to blame vehicles. They're just not simply the majority of at fault in the, in the last couple of years. So let's talk a little bit about the known suspected causes or collisions. So again, six of the multi-vehicle were deemed rider error, making that a total of 63% of fatalities being rider error. We had an interesting one this year, and I'll, I'll throw it again to Justin. At the start of the year, we had a motorcycle to motorcycle head-on collision at the start of 2021. Is that something you would normally see? In 22 years of doing this as a city of Edmonton firefighter and uh, 25 years as a, as a firefighter, I've never seen anything like that. I don't think that that's something that we would likely see a lot of. However, um, multi-motorcycle accidents is definitely something that we do see a lot of, and it's usually people riding together. So the, the group riding and somebody goes down and that kind of... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Definitely. We had some environmental things. I was actually talking with Justin just before we came on, on about uh, high winds and how that can affect us. Loss of control, uh, ran off the road, hit a median, excessive speed, hit and runs, 
uh, you know, we had a, a rider who was out without a chaperone, only a class five, struck a vehicle and, uh, and ended up uh, deceased from that collision. Two rear-enders, one a bike rear-ended a vehicle, one a vehicle rear-ended a bike. I mean, let's try and give each other space. Left turns, we actually, first time since we've been doing this, that we had a rider who was at fault in a left-hand turn. And then there was an unfortunate, of course, drunk driver uh, incident. So we have our own conclusions at AMSS about statistics like this, uh, with the, the schools being shut down in 2020, reopening in 2021 with limited class sizes, no licensing in 2020, and reopening but fully backed up in 2021. Bike sales were up. John, do you think there are any types of other factors that might have played in fatalities that you can think of? Um, you know, I, I think a big part of it with the with the COVID shutdowns and all that stuff that went on is, you know, everyone could agree maybe it wasn't managed that well uh, by the government and place a lot of blame on things like that. But it was also not managed well by a lot of the people in our community. You know, everyone went out there and said, you know, this is the one thing I can do and go ride motorcycles. And, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, there was a lot of craziness, you know, out there. and People just doing weird, crazy things you know you saw it not only in bike uh, bike meets saw it in car meets last year too it was just that community sort of uh, exploded the scenes all got a lot bigger a lot faster and uh, you saw a lot of poor decisions being made uh, as a result of people that just this is all I can do so I'm gonna go do it 110 percent you know so. yeah absolutely and Lanchi with the schools being shut down are you seeing that there's a long wait time for people to get into rider training even now in 2022? So for us particularly, um, we, we reduced our class sizes since COVID just because of the restrictions on how many people can be together at a time. And we've kept that still just in case the, the restrictions change. But we find there's a lot of people who who are really impatient, they don't want to wait. And so if they can't get in right away, they will just go and, um, you know, get on a bike and try to figure it out themselves or get a friend to teach them. So I think with that, and especially back in 2020, what the huge thing is that people just didn't want to be patient. They had to get on the bike now and we're still seeing it, it this year. Um, with registrations this year, I've had people calling I don't want to be waiting, you know, um, can you get me in now? Is there anything you can just squeeze me in? It's just a lot of impatience. That's unfortunately impacting a lot of people and their safety. Yeah, and I think it, it is understanding the last two years have been an anomaly and, and so patience with mm -hmm. everything from getting into rider training and licensing, even right down to parts and apparel, there's a backlog of supply chain issues with that. So we talked a little bit last year about gear, but this is something that we need to continue to encourage uh, the, the use of proper gear. Okay, and I'm gonna preface this because I have no idea what Justin is exactly gonna share with us, so I'll put a small disclaimer that some things mentioned could be sensitive for some people. Our goal is never to trigger negative memories of those who have endured any injuries from riding. We hope that, the frank, that we're frank enough so that others can avoid these types of trauma. So Justin, you're a first responder who likely sees a lot of collisions, incidents. Without going into too much of a graphic detail of things, what are some things that you have rolled up on that maybe gear could have played a role? Like what types of injuries do you see? A lot of our incidents that we have with motorcycles, uh, especially on city streets in Edmonton, tend to be small incidents where people are injured. We have lots of abrasions. We have, uh, you know, usually, um, you know, some, some minor injuries in the grander scheme. Then when we start to see multi-vehicle incidents or people where they start to hit stationary objects, that's where we start to see larger and larger incidents. And, that's where the gear starts to come into play a little bit more is that 
when we see people who are out riding in a set of denim jeans and a uh, set of sneakers and they've got their, you know, their helmet on and a set of gloves and they figure that that's, that's good enough to try and be able to, to make it work. Um, it's fantastic for an uh, afternoon ride. Unfortunately, it doesn't help for that, uh, that crash that is inevitably gonna happen to, to people you know, when we put that many people on the street. So um, some of the things that uh, I'll kind of was hoping to go through today is take a look at some of the gear that is available to us um, as riders and discuss why it actually is important rather than why you need to have it. Everybody understands that gear is important. Everybody understands that you know, there's a certain level of risk with what we do as motorcyclists, whether we're out on the racetrack, uh, riding around, or whether we're out uh, going for you know, a street ride with our friends. So we kind of brought in some gear today and I uh, want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are available. So before we get into that though, you're telling me that my fancy Converse, even mm -hmm. though they have motorcycles on them, mm -hmm. not appropriate. Well, <laughs> I think that they are perfectly appropriate for what you're doing right now, not so much for riding something like that, no. <laughs> All right, where do you want to start? Because we have uh, quite a bit of gear to go through here. Why don't we start uh, with some of the, the jackets and leathers uh, to, to kind of go through some of the things and uh, discuss a little bit about uh, street riding apparel and then also mm -hmm. as we're starting to gear up towards uh, more um, performance type uh, apparel. So when we're looking at things like what we have here with uh, just a regular street jacket, one of the things you'll notice that there's a lot of um, armor that's built in. That armor is some of the things that help with not just the abrasion resistance, but also with the impact. Those impact areas tend to be in joints. That's where we see where people um, fracture um, some of their, their body parts on the initial impact. The other thing is, is that you'll take a look, and I'm going to pull up some of the gloves. We have things like what we have here with our lowest um, protection available. You'll see that there's actually armor that's built into things like the, the gloves and the knuckles and the fingers. Gloves like this will have just a little bit of abrasion resistance inside the palms. However, there's nothing really in here um, in order to take any sort of um, impact. Next up, we'll have something that has a little bit more. So once again, you can see that there's actually a, um, there's a piece here where we've got some impact resistance, but then inside the palms, we actually have the ability to have some slide. So we actually have something where the impact is there, but we also are able to slide across the ground. Most people don't realize that when they hit the ground, that that impact tends to be um, where you slap your hands and your feet down. So that hands and feet as you're slapping down, that's where we start to see all the, um, the actual fractures that come from, um, from our uh, hands, from our feet, from our elbows, uh, and that's what, what tends to be the big ones that hit. The next up is the highest level of protection where we have a gauntlet style glove. Those gauntlet style gloves come up over top of a set of leathers like this so that there is no ability to open up your wrist and have your actual wrist be exposed to a slide. That's where things like uh, our track days and our racing, like what we do here with John, um, that's where these gloves are so important is that they leave it so that there's no ability for you to hit the soft tissue that's on the insides of your wrist. And that's where something that is more like these shorty style gloves, that's what happens with them is that they open up the wrist aspect and leave that open to abrasion. So I need new gloves. <laughs> I, I have I'm gauntlets go ahead and at say home. That no, no, I have actually uh, race gloves that, that have gauntlets at home. I should probably start wearing those more is what you're saying. Absolutely. And the, the nice thing about them is that they are, they can be stylish, they can be um, yeah. comfortable. There's nothing that is really taken away from having a glove like that. The only thing that you get extra is all the protection, which is why we're buying the gear in the first place anyways. Um, seeing as I'm here, we can discuss a little bit about uh, the next step up when we talk about leather protection for your body. So once again, we have things like the elbow protection for your actual impact. You'll see that there's actually some metal um, that gets put into these. That's more for the hit uh, against the ground for the slide. So being able to hit and roll and slide allows you to stop from tucking 
Um, these sliders here are more for um, protection against the suit from when you're cornering a motorcycle, but these also help with the fact that when you hit, it doesn't just pull your arm in, break collarbones, it actually slides across the ground. Inside the knees, you can see that there's a great big tall knee pad here. That knee pad is actually built specifically so that when you were to hit the ground that you have that impact resistance, but also in order to make sure that uh, if you're to slide across the ground that you have the ability to um, have the protection. The really cool thing that's come out here in the last few years though is what we've got with these suits is that these suits now come with an airbag. The airbag inside deploys when you're ejected from a motorcycle and it starts to protect collarbones, your back, down across your kidneys and uh, they've even got ones now that are going in and around your hips. That ability to protect from the initial impact has been one of the things that we've noticed on, on the racetrack has really helped with a lot of our, our riders to uh, be able to pick themselves off the ground, dust off the bike, you know, go back to the pits, make a couple of changes and uh, be able to, to go out and ride again. And that's pretty substantial when you think about how fast these motorcycles um, are moving in a competition sort of category versus somebody going out for a coffee with their friends. Absolutely, and that air tech is becoming more and more available for the general public. I think um, Alpine Stars has come out with some air tech for people. Yeah. Um, but since we're on kind of pantaloons, I brought in um, some Kevlar leggings, which Justin wasn't aware exists. So he was taking a closer look at these. They've got reinforced knees in here. They're full Kevlar from top to bottom. These are my go-to pants. They have been with me since 2014 and still look pretty darn new. Um, and they are the pants I wear the most. It's good coverage and good protection. Kevlar does what for material? Kevlar is really, really high resistance to abrasion and it, uh, it gives you the ability to have the, the breathability that you wouldn't necessarily have out of something like leather in either of these jackets. The textiles you'll see they are very, very comfortable. They tend to be really good, especially for um, being able to handle inclement weather, um, but they're a one-time use. So a, a jacket like this, it hits the ground. All of the Kevlar and the uh, material here, it hits the ground and it sort of gives up its life in order to be able to have that abrasion resistance. Once that's done, that, uh, that jacket or that suit tends to be, um, it's done. Uh, leather, on the other hand, depending on the incident, we tend to see the ability to reuse it uh, you know, multiple times. So that's where we tend to try and push people more towards something like a, a leather uh, jacket versus a um, textile jacket for any time when we're bringing people out to the racetrack. However, on the streets, something like this is a spectacular option for us. And it's got lots of vents in it. Absolutely. Let's move to the most important part of our bodies, which is our head. So we have a, a couple of different helmets here, one which was involved in a collision. Mm -hmm. Let's get to why these half helmets are maybe not the best choice. Well, and this is kind of one of the big things that, um, that I've unfortunately had, um, I've had to see throughout the years is that we have head injuries as one of our major um, leading causes for our fatalities. And um, when we take a look at something like a half helmet and just the way that it's actually built, you can see that the entire base of the skull is all left open. So it will protect around the crown of the head, but unfortunately everything is left open on the sides, everything is left open in the mandible. So if there is a incident and a, a rider hits the ground, there's so much of your, of your head that is left exposed that that's where we start to see some major, major issues. Of course, as everybody understands, is that being able to um, breathe properly is kind of an important part of us staying, uh, staying alive. And when we all of a sudden start to see people that bounce off of the ground with their mandible, that's where we start to have issues with our, our airway management. And that's where things like this are the scariest to me. And that's where ICON did this study about that. And it shows the percentages of, you know, your impact when, if you are involved in a collision. 
Can you just kind of take a look around at those percentages in those areas that you spoke to that the health helmet doesn't protect well, versus is, what it does? This is a part of that, that same conversation. It's, a, it's such a great way to, to kind of do this, and this is such a, a great prop for that. When we take a look at the actual mandible area, that area where we're starting to discuss about how to you know, do airway management, we're looking at 30% of our, 35% of our hits are around the mandible. Well, that area is completely exposed with the half helmet. Now, everybody understands that a half helmet is nice, it's uh, very airy, it's uh, comfortable. Unfortunately, you leave yourself open for 30% of your injuries to your airway just through that alone. Then taking a look through across the back here, the part that's actually exposed, we've got about 18% of our, um, of our injuries are gonna be happening down from the midline down into the, the base around here. That's all exposed with a, a half helmet as well. So as you can see in this particular incident, so I'll try and hold this here, the amount of energy that is put into something like this and down into the chin, there's a huge, huge amount of energy that's put into, into the brain. The big thing with helmets that we've really come to, to learn is that the brain is actually held in place and um, sits in a, a floating sack. When it accelerates and thus decelerates in an accident, that's where the injury comes. So the more we can try and have that squish and that slow release of the energy, that's where we start to see um, people be able to have the best recoveries from the brain injuries that are inevitable. And a helmet like this, um, and it'll be really tough to show on screen, but the foam inside is actually deformed, it's crushed because of the way that this helmet um, gave up its life in order to save this person's uh, um, brain. And uh, we all actually know the person that was wearing this helmet and uh, it's really interesting to see how well it looks on the outside and then inside see how much energy actually got transferred into, um, into this helmet. Yeah, I was, I, when I saw that helmet, I was like, I have the exact same one. So I know that my noggin is pretty protected. Now, the last part of the gear that we're going to talk about, it's not something that you wear, but something that's kind of come out in the last few years through our, our friend at Head On First Aid, Adam Calver. So we have this small uh, first aid kit that can attach to my bike or my gear or, or whatever. And Justin, being a first responder and, a, and fire, went through it earlier. What did you find um, about this, this smaller kit? Because there is two sizes. So just getting an opportunity to go through and take a look, I was, I was trying to explain is that a lot of the, the stuff that I found inside this kit is exactly what I have for my kit that I bring out to the racetrack. Um, I have had the unfortunate... Uh, <laughs> experience of bouncing off of the ground a few times myself <laughs> and uh, get, so to, get to play first aid on myself and go visit our, our ambulance a few times to, uh, to let them do a little first aid on me as well. Um, but a lot of the stuff that is absolutely crucial to being able to deal with small incidents are right here. Um, things like, uh, like wound care. A lot of what people don't realize is that most of the incidents we have when we talk about abrasion especially is that it tends to be like a burn. And so there's a lot of stuff that's in here that are burn related and that will help uh, sort of clean up those, uh, those injuries and be able to get you so that you have an opportunity to get to the hospital and actually go and seek um, medical attention. So I, uh, I was really, really happy to see what, uh, what you guys put together with this. I think it's a really nice kit. Excellent. So again, those are available on our web store linked to Adam's um, if, you, if you can't find head on first aid. There are two sizes for that, and I would really highly suggest somebody in your riding group at least carries one of those, as well as maybe take a head-on first aid uh, safety training course. Now, speaking of training, training is something that we always encourage riders to invest in, whether you're starting out or even as a seasoned rider like myself. Never stop learning or growing as a rider. There's an old saying that says, once you know it all or you think you know it all, that motorcycle will teach you a very, very hard lesson. And with that, I am going to focus on Lanchi, our friend. As you can see, she is live on site at the Too Cool Motorcycle School. Uh, Trevor is in the middle of teaching a course with some students today. So Lanchi, how long has Too Cool been around and what kind of courses do you offer? 
So Chuckle's been around since 2003. Uh, we do basic training so from the ground up for anybody who's never been on a bike to refresher courses where um, individuals can come on their own machines and go through some emergency, sorry, I'm eating my hair because it's windy, um, <laughs> emergency, <laughs> emergency skills, some slow speed. Um, and then we used to, at one point when we had the racetrack, we did advanced training, so a lot of higher speed street skills. So we've just been waiting for a track to open up. For oh, oh, I think we just lost Lanchi and she froze up. To, oh, there she is. That. So pressures of... Uh, Press, press, press. Refreshers and is it still there? Still there? Hello? Uh, you're still there. You're cutting in and out. Okay. I think the weather is playing some fun with us, but you're okay. Keep going. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So our basic training, test preps, just to get students ready for that, um, the refreshers, and as I was saying, hopefully some advanced uh, street training. And then we also do some private one-on-one -on -one for, for individuals who are looking to get a little bit more practice on their own machines as well. What do beginners need to know when they uh, sign up for a course? What, what should they get before, like prep, gear? Should they get on a bike before they come see you? We always tell people that they're grounded from being on a bike prior to coming out, just because before they actually get the training in, everything that they do is just based on perhaps, you know, uh, guesswork or if somebody is teaching them themselves and the problem with that is if something were to happen now they have this fear that roots in and then it makes training even harder that's assuming that it's not too bad of an incident we've had situations in the past where we've had students call and say you know i i decided to get on a bike because i was too excited i did i could wait for the classes to start and uh, something happened and now I, I can't do the class. So there's that. Um, as far as gear goes, we provide all the gear at our school. And so we usually just tell students just, you know, if you're really wanting to get your own, your helmet and such, then go through our classroom stuff on the information of the gear so that you are choosing the correct gear and the right fit. Um, but if they were to come out, then they can try the gear that we have and see how it goes. Also, it allows them to not have to focus on the, the, the decision of trying to figure out which gear they need, the cost of it. They can just focus entirely on just the training aspect of it, figure out what type of writing they want to do, if they even want to do it, and then go from there. Another thing for coming out is that the individual has to be the one who wants to ride. So sometimes we get individuals who sign up because a partner or spouse or family member or friend push them into doing that. And that's one thing that it just doesn't work. Um, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we've seen that. I, I remember being in my course, I'm not gonna date myself, it was a long time ago. And there was a, there was a wife who was there because her husband was pushing her into doing it. And you could tell she didn't want to be there. And it's that respect thing. If they want to do it, then yeah, that's great. If they don't, yeah. don't push them. Some people just want to be a passenger or don't want to ride at all. Would you say, that, would you say that training could greatly reduce the chances of being involved in a collision? Absolutely. So the training, it teaches you the skills in terms of the motorcycle control. Um, be aware of situations around you. And because we get a lot of students who come out and they, going through the training, they'll actually say, you know, I didn't realize all these things that we're learning is helpful. We've had students who take the basic course, even though they've had their license for years, they use it as a refresher. And there's a lot of things that they'll say, I didn't even realize that, you know, all these years that I've been riding, I didn't realize and I don't know how I'm even alive today. So there's a lot of skills to, that will help keep individuals out of situations and or if they are get themselves in a situation that they have a better chance of getting out of it or reducing the risk of injury. 
and, and we have a podcast that will be coming up a little later in the season with one of our members, uh, Dan Cochran. 18-year-old Dan grew up on dirt, thought he knew it all, passed the rider test, no problem, got his license, and very quickly realized the street is different. So what about like someone like me who has been riding a long time? Can I benefit from some rider training? Absolutely. Um, as you were saying, you know, in terms of once you think that you know everything, that's when the problem is, right? So a lot of the times, just the same thing with car driving, right? We become complacent. We pick up bad habits along the way. So I think coming back to training, it takes you back to square one. Even if, whether you take the basic training again or you take ad additional advanced training, it just takes you back to the basics and says, okay, let's just refresh all these things that maybe I, you know, picked up the bad habits or I don't utilize enough. For example, the uh, emergency skills. How often are we using emergency braking? So if we're coming out and going through the emergency braking, we're refreshing our muscle memory for that. Or there's different techniques perhaps that at the time, if you did your training a long time ago, there might be certain techniques that have evolved through the years that will actually help you out now. Absolutely. I, I think I do need some sort of a refresher course. I'm sure I've picked up some bad habits. But training isn't just at our rider training school. As you all know, we are huge fans of the whole take it to the track. Where once track days were not as affordable, you would be surprised at what you can do now. Not to mention what a great place to let loose and hone your skills. Where last year our guest spoke about vintage motocross, this year we go to road racing with John Bully. So some people may not know what road racing is. Can you wrap it up in a nutshell? Uh, when we go road racing, uh, it's usually on Sunday. We get a whole bunch of, uh, of our friends together and uh, we see who can go, go around the track fastest. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a lot of fun. That's, that's putting it very simply, but uh, it's a lot of fun and it's real exciting. It, it really is that in a nutshell, who can, who can lap the fastest. But there are different levels on that. How long have you been racing and where did you start? Where are you now? Uh, so I'm gonna say I started racing in 2010. Uh, my first time at a racetrack, I showed up just as a, a corner worker volunteer, saw all the guys riding their motorcycles so fast and was just like, I have to do this somehow, some way. Uh, we actually, the EMRA pays all their volunteers with free track time, so I took my free track time, went back to the track, rode on the track. If I wasn't hooked before, I was 100% <laughs> hooked now. <laughs> You know, I did track days uh, for a couple years. Uh, you know, it was amazing. I dragged my knee, uh, which if you don't know, that puts you at like just a, a level, you know, that when you do it finally, you, you wouldn't, uh, you know, you think you're, you've reached this God level of motorcycle <laughs> racing. And, and uh, so it's lots of fun doing that. And I got more and more involved with the club. Um, took my race school actually through Justin here. Uh, I was a little bit late getting to class. Uh, he called me up and I said, where are you, man? You're missing out. I was actually working on my motorcycle, lost track of time. So uh, got myself to the race school and basically never looked back. Uh, I've been up and down North America now, uh, racing Canada, the US. Um, you know, it's been a little harder the last couple of years just because of COVID and getting across the border. Um, but I'm looking forward to going back to the States this October, if not sooner. Um, yeah, and it's just a lot of fun. Competed at, I'm going to say, pretty much all levels. Uh, Canadian Superbike when it was in town here. And, uh, I mean, probably 90% of my racing is just uh, in town here with the EMRA. Perfect. So how would someone get started? What kind of gear? What, are their, what does their bike have to be like? Where do you suggest someone starts with a motorcycle? Uh, yeah. 300? So Oh, well, yeah, yeah, 300 is 100% a good place to start. Um, it's, it's a fun, it's so much fun riding those little bikes. There's the, they're uh, slow in the straights, fast in the corners, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah, that's what we like doing on the track, you know, the, the straightaway parts don't really matter so much. That's where you just chill out and you take a break and you think about where your car keys are and like what time <laughs> did you call your wife and tell her you're going to be late. Uh, 
you know, that sort of stuff. And then when you get into the corners, that's where the fun's like really happening and really beginning. That's where all the challenges and everything are too. So corners are definitely a good spot. 300 is a fantastic bike uh, to, to ride on. I remember when I got into uh, racing, you know, that, that sort of market wasn't really around. You didn't have much choice. And I think riders these days, uh, street track, everyone's blessed with tons of more, like better options for little bikes. Um, affordable, options. affordable options too. I mean, you know, the little lightweight bikes go through one set of tires a year. On uh, on these bigger bikes, you go through one set of tires in a day, if not if not sooner. <laughs> Depends how fast you want to go. Um, so gear wise, though, I mean, not everybody is going to afford a four thousand yeah, dollar race suit. Yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah, it is. It is a big step to get into racing, just because you know safety is our is our number one at the track, and so we do have a lot of strict requirements. You know, one of those is not only that you're Helmet is a uh, full face with one of the certifications that we require, but it also can't be any older than five years. Uh, you know, as we spoke about earlier with the, the helmets and the technology that goes into them, helmets five years ago, you know, even if it's been in a box and it's perfectly fine and whatever, man, they're just not as safe as the new helmets that are on the market today. So every five years, you know, we require the racers to um, replace the helmets every single year. Uh, with uh, AMSS, we also require the, the racers to have a medical data carrier. This is just like a little information card that goes on the outside of your helmet. So we always have that uh, ready for you know our ambulance people if they need it at the track, if they need it to help you. Now the spoiler, does everybody know what color they are this year? I don't think they do, but... Uh, Can I tell them? Go, yeah, sure. Reflective orange yeah, this year. We, we Last year was reflective blue. We, we ordered some extras for a limited. We do have some left. We ordered some extras this year for a limited edition to the general public of reflective orange. Mm -hmm. yeah, we go through this every year, John and I. Yeah, exactly. we pick the color. <laughs> we, gotta, we, we change it up to keep it fresh and make sure, you know, everyone's got up-to-date medical information. Um, you know, we were not calling any ex-girlfriends or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> if you had that in your medical data carrier, I've heard that story a couple times. So uh, yeah, we like keeping that stuff fresh. Um, like Justin was saying earlier with the gloves, you know, we require a gauntlet style glove, the boots, the boots. I mean, this is a perfect example here. You know, you're going to want a motorcycle racing boot, you know. Uh, you don't want the, the shorter ones. You want the taller no, ones. No, yeah. And some... so it, in our rules, it, it does require it to cover your ankle yeah. eight inches high. So a boot like this won't, uh, won't pass. We're going to want something more like this. And it's going to be better equipped for uh, like what you're doing at the track. It's got little things like toe sliders here when you're getting pretty low in the corners. And then another big safety item that like a, a racing style boot will have is the heel cup. Like Justin was saying earlier, when you crash, you know, you end up just, you smack your feet on the ground. And uh, I mean, I've got, some, I've got uh, a little bit of a limp from, uh, you know, not having the right footwear on uh, in a motorcycle accident. And uh, these, these heel cups, little things like that, all the extra little sliders, on the boot, uh, they come in real handy and they're definitely effective on the racetrack. Um, our suits that we require too, uh, you know, we ask everyone have a one-piece suit. We do accept uh, two-piece suits, bit of a compromise. They have to zip. Full uh, 360? Uh, I think it's three quarters of the way around. Uh, yeah, they have to, the top and the bottom have to zip. The thing is when you're sliding down the track like that, the first thing that's gonna happen is your two-piece suit is gonna wanna right up your back and uh, you, you know, you're, you're not going to have much fun when that uh, starts happening. So we got, we got some pretty high standards too. Other little things that we have is we require like a motorcycle racing specific back protector to be in the suit and uh, it comes in real handy. Does it have to be in the suit or can it be like I, I have one myself for when I, when I do my type of racing that just kind of Velcros on at full spine protection under my jacket. Is that acceptable? Yeah, yeah, that's totally, that's totally perfect. That's what we want. Um, you know, there's some in, uh, in some suits, you know, they have just a little foam insert and we want something that's going to have a proper hard shell or like a, a CE uh, certification behind it. Absolutely. Did you want to add something? Well, with that said, uh, John specifically speaking about the EMRA and with racing, however, our track days and our schools out at, uh, at the racetrack are also um, something that we should probably take a look at in regards to the gear. Sure. And 
the standards for that are a little bit more relaxed. And the reason is, is because we're getting people involved at the racetrack. We're trying to get them to come out and learn how to ride their motorcycles. And we want to get, make it as accessible as possible so that they have an opportunity to come out and experience what these bikes can do. So when we talk about these shoes, for example, um, a leather work boot that has the abrasion resistance is allowed. A boot that comes up over top of your ankle, that is also allowed. Is it as good as a full race boot? No, but it is the, the minimum requirements. When we take a look at um, the full face helmets, that is a non-negotiable, exactly what John is talking about, that is an absolute non-negotiable. There's no damage that can be allowed. The gauntlet style gloves, that's a non-negotiable. But when we take a look at, uh, let's say textile, um, pants and jacket, those are allowed as long as they have that, oh. pardon me, as long as they have that, um, that armor that's inside the elbows in order to make sure that it's there. Same thing with the pants, it has to have that armor that's inside the pants and that's there specifically to make sure that if there is an impact, that that impact is absorbed. Perfect. And then just really quickly, because we're, we're going to run short on time and we have a couple other things we need to talk about. We have two motorcycles in front of us uh, today. One's a race bike and one's set up for street. Quick differences between the two. I'm, mirrors are one for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, no I've, one's I've, checking this, their mirrors this is on the my, track. Uh, this is my little uh, street bike that I've got over here. I've actually set it up just to do track days. Uh, you know, so it's a, it's a nice, polite, friendly street bike. Uh, it's real, real cushy. I got everything full soft on there. And then when you step up to uh, a race bike, you know, you've got the race fairings, uh, probably a very angry race motor in there, slick tires. Damper. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Steering <laughs> a damper. Quarter inch foam seat that little is teeny, not yeah, exactly little... uh, street orientated. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a much more focused machine uh, when you get into the, the race bikes. Uh, but for just track days, uh, you know, you're going to want to bring a bike that can handle the track. Uh, so, we're, you know, we always ask for something in good mechanical shape. Uh, good tires. Um, don't don't bring the tires that are nice and square now to the track and say, oh, I'm only going to be using the side part. That part's still good. Well, it's, you'd be amazed, you know, when you start breaking a motorcycle, you know, you start pretty much straight up and down and that part of your tire is, uh, you know, long past its best before date. So yeah, tires are very important. Things like brakes too. Uh, brakes have brake fluid in them. And a lot of people really? are, yeah, a lot of people are surprised <laughs> by that. And, and that actually has like a shelf life on it too. And uh, you'd be amazed uh, how quickly you can discover that it does have a shelf life when you're on the racetrack and you, you jump on the brakes and suddenly they're, they're not what you remember them being. <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's an important thing like that. Uh, a couple of little things that, uh, you know, we ask before you come to the track that you just make sure that your street bike is uh, totally... Uh, going to be able to handle the, the day on track. And I mean, I've seen everything from like a Harley Sportster, you know, that we had out there last year, you know, Suzuki Hayabusa's, uh, we had a couple super motards. So really anything, Concourses. yeah, concourse, ooh, that like, um, anything that you want to bring to the track and ride and experience on the track, uh, I definitely encourage uh, people to do it. Perfect. So schedules are up on Emory website. Track days would be on Motorhead's track tag. Yep. And Justin, you have some events on on-track performance as well. Yep. well. On the OTP website, we have all of our dates, and we work closely with uh, the EMRA and with Motorhead's as well uh, as a community in order to try and uh, bring out those schools to, um, to those people looking to come out to the track. Perfect. And uh, we will have all that linked up. It already is on our website, but, but we'll link it up. So we're going to move on a little bit here. One thing that we notice is that we've never really fully explained what our annual campaign and how we've grown that over the past few years. So I'm going to welcome our Vice President, Marty Forbes, up for a little conversation about what does our campaign entail? Because we don't really explain that too much every year. Well, how long is the uh, is the broadcast? I mean, <laughs> Well, let's, let's shorten it up a little bit. Do the Coles notes. Yeah. No. We, First off, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished in the last seven years. I mean, th th we're unique in Canada. And, you know, we're connected at every single level with, with trainers and, and experts and, you know, the government to be able to do the work that we do. And you and I generally, you know, we, we connect by, te uh, by text most often, two and three times a day. But anytime there's a, 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 a collision or a death, 
we're trying to study what's going on. So we get a really good handle of what's going on uh, in the industry that we're trying to support. So we take all that data, as you've seen, and you've chronicled it really well with the, uh, with the slideshow today, and we craft out what the messaging that we feel is the most pertinent. And as was covered with our, our Calgary people here the last couple of years, everything was dramatically different. So we craft a radio spot, we craft a television spot, and then we go out to the media, and I'm quite fortunate with five decades of association with these people, that uh, they literally have been unbelievable. We could not afford to pay for the amount of coverage that radio, television, and print have given us. And we reach literally every market in this province, from small radio stations to Edmonton, Calgary, uh, the Grand Prairies, Fort McMurray's, Jasper, Banff, and people keep hearing this messaging over and over and over. And the one thing when we started doing this, we, we said, we, we don't want to preach to anybody. We're not, a motor, we're not against, uh, you know, truckers and whatever. It, it, you know, this is a share of the road. This is an understanding. So all of our messaging really is to help people in, that are on the roads uh, understand the magnificence of what motorcycling is and changes when you see one of us on the road. So it's been an amazing process. I, I can't imagine the reach, but every year we do see that we've made some success. And the equipment thing was just great, guys. I, I've really noticed over the last couple of years people ramping up. I think they're spending money. I think they're getting trained, and that our messaging is cutting through at a really good level. Excellent. And we want to send a big, huge thank you to Reaper at CJ in Calgary for voicing our public service announcements that will be on the radio this year. Uh, we will be on some TV as well as uh, those annoying commercials you can't skip on YouTube or when you're streaming TV. We've gone digital. We, we've gone fully digital. So we're going to pop up on your phones. We're going to be one of those annoying co uh, commercials that you can't skip by. Anything to get messaging in front of people. But thank you to all the Alberta media once again for stepping up to air our PSAs throughout the province. Always grateful for the continued generosity, as Marty said. We would have never been able to afford all, all of the generosity that we've received from media outlets across the province. We're going to turn to For the Love of Motorcycles. Now, sadly, June 25th is a really busy day in our city. It's, it's a now concert or something going some, on. Some, some Garth guy. Brooks guy. Yeah. Yeah. And then, it, like, you guys are racing. Yeah, you know, like. Anyway, we have a very new and exciting event that will be kicking off this year, and we hope to run it annually going forward. For the Love of Motorcycles is a fully outdoor event, like an outdoor market for the motorcycle community. Some of you watching may have attended Two Wheel Sunday in Calgary. This would be considered a sister event to that. To help us talk about this more, Marty's going to help me explain what this is all about. Uh, so just before we get into that, Two Wheel Sunday is on June 5th. We will be there. And then 20 days later, we're going to be at Blackjack's Roadhouse. Marty, how did we come up with this idea? <laughs> well, we have a great team of people that work with us. And over the last six or seven years, we have attended virtually everything that's going on that are associated with motorcycles uh, to help support various causes. And then the last summer, with basically everything shut down, including the bike shows, we said, wouldn't it be kind of neat? Because I think we've kind of earned the respect for what we've done out there. So let's host our own event. Now, uh, the one thing I'm very proud about is the fact that motorcyclists support charity big time. The fun runs and everything. So uh, I just thought it'd be a wonderful time to you know, kind of put a bunch of things together. And I'm very fortunate that I do some board work. And Santa's Anonymous. <laughs> With who else? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Santa's Anonymous was started by my father in 1955. 300 toys in the basement of a, of a radio station downtown. It's 21, 25,000 toys now. And a few years back, it took us a dozen years, but we actually built a tribute building to my dad, named after him, called the Jerry Forbes Center for Community Spirit. So Santa's Warehouse is in this building. It is massive. It is efficient. And then the rest of the bu building is 24, uh, 22, 24 public service agencies. I can't name them all, but I think Special there was Olympics. Some Special and Olympics, there was uh, so Narcotics many. Anonymous. There's just, it, it reaches every gambit, and all of them are listed on the Jerry Forbes website as well. Yeah. 
there's just so much going on in that facility. It, it's open to, it's open collaboration between all these different nonprofits and charities. They need some help with funding too, so that's kind of why we're going that way. Part of it is because it's my way to give back to Marty for seven years of getting us all this media that we would have never been able to afford. You know, what do you get the guy who has everything? You <laughs> get him an event that supports two very important causes that were uh, named after his father or created by his father. Right, and there's some amazing people in that, Bill. Every time I go in, I get hugs, and, and it's just absolutely wonderful. And they're up against everybody else ramping up after the last couple of years. So every golf tournament, every fun run, every concert and every benefit, everybody has their hands out looking for support. So in the building the other day when we held a meeting, they're still wearing masks. Half the people are still not coming, or are still not back in their offices. And I said, you know, what does this mean to you guys? This means everything. We didn't lose a tenant in two years of COVID. That's something else. That's how well structured and run this building is. So it'll be an opportunity to come to Blackjacks, who are just the gods of putting things together really, really well. It'll be every type of motorcycle you can imagine. It'll be expertise, training. There isn't going to be a thing you can't ask or enjoy about motorcycling, plus entertainment, plus things for the kids to do. Show and shine. The details just went up on our website yesterday about awesome. the show and shine. And it's aptly named. This, this will be to be for the love of what we do. And really, lunch break, guys, come across the highway. We're like <laughs> right say, oh, there. We're just, yeah. we're just down the road. Exactly. Sure. <laughs> we're just across the street. Just pop over for lunch. Thank you so much for that, Marty. The event again, June 25th at Blackjack's Roadhouse in Nisku, 10 till 3. More information can be found on our website. So as I mentioned at the start of the show, Launched also today in conjunction with Motorcycle Awareness Month is our very first Think Bike 5050 Cash Raffle. This 5050 will help support the creation of educational content from AMSS in 2023. The winner could take home up to $10,000. All of the information and rules about this can be found on our contest page of our website, found under About Us. There is also a direct link right on the home page for this. Per the rules, I must note that this 5050 carries the, L the license number AGLC 597424. One of the very important rules on this, though, is any of the current executive board members and any immediate family that they live with are not allowed to participate. It is wide open for everybody else across the province. If we sell out early, I think we might be able to award early. I'm not sure. At the end of the day, you could win up to $10,000 and help us continue what we're trying to do. And that brings us to the end of our kickoff show. We're looking forward to this year where we can get out and see people. We'll be at Two Bill Sunday on, ugh, Two Bill Sunday on June 5th in Calgary. And of course, you don't want to miss out on the first annual For the Love of Motorcycles from 10 till 3 on June 25th at Black Jack's Roadhouse in Nisku. It's going to be a great time. Big thank you to Lanchi, Justin, and John for being with us today. And a huge thank you to Production World for hosting us world-class facility with a world-class team. This is Leanne reminding you to ride smart, ride safe, and think bike, and we'll see you out on the road. Same person, same commute, different risk. One of the leading causes of serious injuries and fatalities in motorcycle collisions are motorcycle riders. In fact, the number one killer is excessive speed in urban areas. Please, do your part to help lower motorcycle-related accidents in Alberta. Use proper riding gear and obey all traffic rules. Ride smart, ride safe, think bike. A message from